Oh, magic. Okay. Thank you very much for coming. Welcome, Matthew, for Sega Fedora. Hello, everybody. I'm Matthew Miller. This is my little bio slide here. Um, I, this talk was originally pitched by Stephen Gallagher, and he um, didn't make it, so I am just going to be giving my own talk in place of his. It's a little bit different than, excuse me, I'm allergic to phosphorus. Um, it's a little di different than he had planned. His was going to be a little more technical, I think. Um, this is going to be a little more high level, but I'm going to go through a bunch of slides and probably skip some of the ones that have too much words on them and uh, give some room for questions at the end. Um, yeah, so this is me. I am the Fedora project leader, which I've been for, I don't know, less than a year now. Um, and but I've been involved in Fedora for about 10 years, worked on Boston University Linux as a university sysadmin. Um, so I guess I have some questions for you, too. Uh, how many people here are Fedora users? Everybody. Awesome. And Fedora contributors? Okay, so a lot of this is going to be um, old hat to most of you, so I will go quickly through the old hat parts of it. Um, the other question is, how many people um, would self-identify as a sysadmin kind of background? And then how many people as software developers? And how many people something other than those categories? What are you other people? Yeah. All right. Um, okay. So that, that, that um, background kind of feeds into some of the stuff that I have to say here, I guess. Okay, so um, this is a slide I've been showing for a, a little while. I got it from um, a different different talk about uh, Donnie uh, from Red Monk gave about um, the, you know, the state of distributions overall. So this is the trend line for Google searches of Fedora operating system, and um, it's their smart magical search so that it is Fedora the operating system, not Fedora the hats. Um, we hope. Uh, and the this axis is magical Google units, so um, we don't we don't know what that is, but um, this axis is time here from 2004 up to like two days ago there at that end. So we see kind of a um, a downward trend and less spikiness from um, the release cycles there as well. Um, and so the important thing to note here is that it's not just that Fedora is terrible. This is a general trend for Linux distributions overall. Everybody has this you know, er exciting peak in the early 2000s and then down and down and down and down from there. Um, and the important slide here, when I show this last one, everybody's like, oh, you left off Ubuntu. Um, so Ubuntu is a larger, they very, very good at publicity and um, very popular, so th good, good for them. But um, we're still in the same boat of everything generally going down uh, overall. Um, and some of the other ones that, you know, if you look on um, DistroWatch, Linux Mint and Arch Linux are like some of the top ones up there. Um, they're actually in the, the Google search, just kind of noise at the bottom. Um, I'm not quite sure what to make of that, but uh, there it is. Uh, so, first response, you know, oh my goodness, have we have we destroyed everything? Is the world on fire? Uh, no, that that's not generally what I'm talking about. Um, it is more a case of this. We have here the the um, world of software, the internet, and everything, full of excitement. And over here, we have um, the Linux distributions, where we have a nice little castle that we're making, um, kind of off in the corner, and we're we're doing a good job of it. But um, all of this stuff is going on, and we are kind of missing out on it. Um, so uh, it, it's not really that. It's more that um, we have traditionally taken you know, all the software that was out there in that world, this mess of things, and we've made nice little Lego bricks of it, which is cool. And um, we've done a good job of that. We should give ourselves a trophy. Um, but uh, while we're busy doing that, um, you know, this, this is kind of a counter trend. Uh, Fedora's going down, uh, GitHub going up. And if you look at the number of packages, and this is actually an outdated slide, this is going to be even more lopsided now because this big red square keeps growing and growing. And this is proportional to the number of packages in Fedora and the number of repositories on GitHub. And even if you assume that you know, 90% of everything is crap and that for GitHub it's 99.999% you know, of everything is crap, that's still so big that there's so much more enthusiasm about open source software and you know, almost you know, some of that stuff is terribly licensed and whatever and a big mess, but there's so much more enthusiasm around open source that we are just not capturing with the traditional distribution model and we never can because this is just so much bigger than us and exponentially bigger than us that that's going to be a hard challenge. Um, so there's more stuff going on in the world that is really different from what we've done traditionally with the operating system. So there's another challenge that we're adapting to. 
Um, so this is, you know, uh, someone quoted me a talk yesterday. Um, base operating system is considered boring. Um, that doesn't mean we don't have um, lots of stuff to do, and there's actually a lot of interesting things going on. But compared to that big picture of everything else going on in the world, um, it's hard to generate excitement. And this is also partly uh, our, our traditional model, the packaging model, is very um, sysadmin friendly and sysadmin focused. And one of the other trends in the world, and the GitHub kind of shows that there is sort of the rise of the developer. And if you look at um, IT and corporate IT, um, sysadmin power is way down and developers get what they want more and more than the way that they didn't before. Um, and so that's a general trend and that kind of influences who's coming into Linux distributions and what people expect from an operating system. Uh, and also um, that then in turn goes to this idea of the, the effort and reward balance of getting your software packaged in a Linux distribution. So it used to be in, you know, a decade ago, uh, 15 years ago, that if you had some open source software, if you wanted to show the world that you were really something, getting your stuff into a Linux distribution, into a major you know, uh, Linux distribution, especially maybe in a commercial one, that would be how you would show everybody you've arrived. I've gotten into Fedora, I'm a serious software package. And now, um, and, and because of that, we are able to set a pretty high bar. So we, you, know, you have to get your package up to a certain quality, you've got to follow these standards, you've got to have your licensing right, all these things. And people would jump through the hoops we set on purpose because the reward at the end was pretty good. And now, um, whether or not that reward is you know, in any, any worse, um, the perception of it is that it's just not worth it as much as it was before because you know, with the way the internet is, you can go direct to your users um, and you can uh, you know, be on GitHub is much more valuable than being in the distribution. So that balance has changed and the amount of work that people are willing to put in to become part of the distribution is different. Um, and then there's this general question of, um, partly because I think we didn't move fast enough with things in RPM and you know, other, uh, that kind of packaging that uh, every language stack has kind of grown its own package manager for that language stack and that is what developers tend to use even if it kind of sucks that all of those things are all different from each other. Um, that is the state of the world and people don't care so much about you know, having it in a distro package and in fact often would prefer it not because they'd rather set up their own little side universe using the uh, language specific thing. Um, I want to also, this is a quick slide, um, the OpenSUSE stuff they're doing with the rings model and the continuous integration is amazing. Everyone is awesome. We've got a lot of great Linux distributions. Everybody's Fedora here, so, but I do want to point out that other people are doing really cool things. Um, and Arch Linux's documentation is awesome. And CoreOS is doing really, really neat things with the next model for distributions that I think that you know, we're doing with um, Project Atomic as well and Ubuntu has their snappy thing. So it's kind of a general thing that's kind of there as well. Um, so anyways, uh, back to what's going on with Fedora. Uh, we got this Fedora Next thing, kind of planning what the next generation of Fedora is going to look like, kind of in response to all of that before and just sort of as a general, we've done this for 10 years, let's take stock. Um, important thing about that is we're generally, we're not trying to throw away the last 10 years, we're trying to take the lessons we've learned from that and build on it and make uh, new cool stuff without um, detracting from what we've really succeeded at. And we really have done a great job of taking all that software and packaging it up to very high standards, so I think that's again, good for us. Um, these are some more of the background things. You can read them. I can, I can answer questions about them more. Um, so um, on to Fedora 21. One of the most visible things we've done here is have this separate Fedora cloud server and workstation uh, products, though they're not actually products in the sense that we're selling anything. They're just different sort of um, editions of Fedora that we present to users in different ways. Um, and this is again back to you know why, why did we why did we do these things? This is one of the questions I'm still getting a lot. I hope I've, I hope I've explained it pretty well. Um, so one of the, the main reasons are that Fedora you know, came out of Red Hat Linux back in the olden days, which was a general purpose distribution used for a lot of server kind of uses before there was an enterprise Linux that they people were sold to a different market instead. Um, and so um, it, we inherited a pretty big user base of people using Fedora on servers and. People actually use Fedora on servers quite a lot today. I don't know how many people in this room are using Fedora on a server. Yeah, so you know, a pretty pretty decent section of the room here. And a lot of people are doing that in pretty heavy production, even though um, that might be a little crazy. I think it's a nice, good kind of crazy. Uh, but over the years, it's been the case that uh, Fedora as Fedora kind of um, seemed to be more and more of a desktop operating system. And we kind of tried to figure out you know, how are we gonna set our defaults and then kind of a, a um, 
developer, Fedora developer voice kind of became uh, focused on making a desktop operating system and then that became frustrating for a lot of the people using it for s servers on system and voice kind of felt like my job in Fedora is going to have to be tell those desktop people quit breaking everything. And so the, the system and voice in Fedora became a very negative stop energy voice and that's unfortunate because um, stereotypes aside, system admins aren't necessarily really all the grumpy people. I think you just end up driving away everyone who wasn't grumpy about it and kind of got into a bad situation. So we wanted to make it something where there was something positive in Fedora that was server oriented and so people who had, you know, wanted that out of Fedora had a positive place to make a voice that was building something rather than just trying to block something. Um, additionally, um, in uh, Fedora Workstation, um, we, you know, we picked this name Workstation instead of just a general desktop. Um, sort of to, to emphasize that we're trying to make it a little more focused. Um, the year of the Linux and the desktop is something that you can always always dream about, but um, you know it was probably 2002, and so now we're we're in a different a different kind of thing about what we're going to do at desktop Linux. And desktop Linux is still important, but um, I don't think that you know it's going to be um, at least in the form that we're going to produce the mass market consumer operating system. Um, you know may, maybe Android is that in some ways Chrome OS. Um, and you know, good luck to everybody who is working on that. It's it's great, but um, I think that it's not necessarily what we can do best. And so we wanted to have something that was kind of more targeted at, in this case, um, the tar chosen target is software developers, so people who are you know, building software with their computer, and they're not necessarily developing Fedora, but developing other software. We want to provide a really good desktop experience for those users. Doesn't mean it's not good for other people because developers are people as well, obviously. Um, but that's the target. And then additionally, um, you know, Fedora, we've put together a cloud image for many releases now, and it is, you know, compared to some other options, not as popular as I think it should be because a lot of Fedora's virtues of being fast moving and innovative are really useful to people who are building things in the cloud and things that are sort of downsides, like having to, you know, reinstall every 13 months are basically non-issues as long as you can revalidate quickly. Um, so I think that we wanted to make sure we could Present, present our cloud stuff as more exciting and more visible, so it wasn't just something you'd find buried on the download page, but a top level um, artifact. And also uh, somewhere where we could try some really experimental things like the Project Atomic, which uses RPM OS tree to put together the operating system rather than installing it at, you know, with YUM or that kind of uh, traditional package management. Uh, so having it, that as a separate thing lets us be a lot more experimental rather than trying again to follow the defaults of the other versions. Uh, so we wanted to grow the user base in some strategic areas and say this is why we want to look at you know, who's using Fedora and we can actually increase that and have a uh, meaningful impact on our user base. Um, having these different defined targets makes it easier to know what you're developing for, so that's kind of an easy thing. And then um, that makes it so we reduce you know, flame wars about you know, what should the file system for Fedora be and have the people who you know, want to uh, say build RHEL out of Fedora or are using it in a server environment who really uh, you know, care about um, multi-path device mapper and LVM and a lot of heavy file system features uh, not be in conflict with people who are like that's totally pointless for the desktop, why would we have that in Fedora? So um, now we can have the answer be yes to both of those, both those groups. And then again, um, it really kind of felt um, to some of the people at Red Hat that Fedora's direction was very disconnected from the needs of RHEL. And that doesn't mean that um, RHEL is pulling, Red Hat's pulling the strings here, but uh, it's one of our pretty important stakeholders and we wanted to make sure that we had a place in Fedora that would be responsive to uh, this kind of concerns as well. And so um, Fedora Server is partly to be part of that. Um, although, you know, the sort of, sort of the stuff we're doing in Fedora Server is really aimed at Fedora users. It isn't aimed to be um, Fedora, uh, is what, you know, what Red Hat's next target is. Um, these are slides you may have seen before, but I like to show them. This is kind of a thing about, uh, you know, I talked about how we're putting all the packages into nice Lego bricks, and that's traditionally what distributions have done. We're making some really nice bricks for you. Here's a big bag of them, and um, go play. And so um, this is Playmobil over here, the other toy. I don't know if, you, if people recognize that from their childhood or have, have kids, um, which is kind of one of Lego's big competitors. And they make play sets that are uh, ready to play out of the box. You open it up and you have your knight and your horse and your castle all ready to go, um, rather than having to build something out of Lego. And so, uh, right? Uh, and, and so, um, but this has, you know, cost of flexibility. You can't make that castle into a spaceship. It is always a castle and it's always that kind of castle. 
Um, so one of the fears when I talk about you know what we're doing with Fedora Next is that we're going to take away your br Lego bricks and just replace it with Playmobil, and then everything will be ruined. Um, that's not the goal. The goal is instead we're going to take those Lego bricks that we've always made. We're going to build some um, cool sets out of them. We'll ship you the sets. We'll ship you the, ship you the instructions. Have it all um, even you know, pre-assembled into these things. But the bricks are still there, and you can even you know once you've got it, you can take the bricks apart. We're not gluing anything together. You can build it into your own things as well. Um, so of, of those things here, um, Fedora Cloud. I talked about these already a little bit, so I'm just going to show you the pretty logos there. Uh -huh. We love the Fedora logo, but it's not very versatile, so we have these new, very simple logos that the Fedora design team came up with that we can uh, kind of use for a lot more different things as well. Uh, and so, oh, this is nice logos there. This is some um, really rough numbers from downloads that I've gotten recently. Um, these are ISO downloads from the server, and there's a whole bunch of caveats here, so that's why I haven't even put numbers on here. But if we look at um, the ISO downloads of the last couple of months of Fedora 21, um, about 70% is Fedora Workstation, about 20% is Fedora Server, and then about 5% for Fedora Cloud, and 5% for um, other spins, like the KDE, XFCE, and those kind of things. Uh, so I think a lot of people are surprised by how popular the Fedora Server is, and um, I, I'm not surprised, but I do feel a little bit validated because I've been saying, look, people really are using this for a server, it's not crazy, and uh, the downloads kind of reflect that. Uh, and some of these things are really hard to measure, like the cloud downloads. Uh, presumably, people are also you know, launching that in EC2, or they're downloading it one time, importing it into Glance and OpenStack, and then running it 18 million times. And we have no good way of measuring that. But um, for downloads, it's 5% you know, there. So I feel pretty good about that at that point. OK, um, so here's a really awesomely confusing graph that doesn't connect to the other one very much at all. This is um, Fedora release by release, starting at um, Fedora 6, 7, and 8 here. This is um, connections to the YUM updates. Um, so this has a huge number of caveats here. The data set is basically a number of connections from an IP address per day. So um, NAT confuses this like crazy, and a whole bunch of other things. And it also, because of that, um, it really is highly skewed towards North America and Europe because in places where the bandwidth is not so readily available, um, people aren't just leaving their systems on all the time to um, connect to the update server. Um, but I think there's some really interesting things we can get from here. Uh, one thing we go over to over here, this is Fedora 21 here, and it looks like we've uh, just surpassed Fedora 20 in popularity um, connections just recently, so that's, that's cool for the new release. Um, one, of the, one of the general trends, well, first of all, Fedora 8 was immensely popular, and I think this is, it was um, the version in EC2 for a long time, but I'm not sure what all, it's not just EC2 IP addresses here, so that's kind of an uh, anomaly. If you look, if you just take, subtract that one out, we kind of see this nice pattern of growth up to there, which I'll, I'll talk about in a second. Um, but one of the, uh, the general thing is that um, we've got about, a new release comes out, and about a third of users immediately update when that release comes out. And then over the course of that release, about another third update uh, when, you know, when the next release comes out. And then there's just this long tail of people who never update their system ever. So that pattern of a third, third, third seems to hold pretty true across most of the releases. Uh, I think that's kind of an interesting thing about our, about our user base there. Um, and then here we have um, Fedora 15 here, which is um, never surpassed 14 in popularity ever, and that's a huge drop <laughs> here as well, which is, you know, that kind of had a lot of people very concerned about what was going on. Um, but one of the things that you see if we, if we stack this rather than having them uh, lines like this um, is actually that Fedora popularity overall didn't decline, just people just stayed on 14 for a really long time. And I'm happy to see that with 20, we're kind of back up here, and I think 21 is going to go back up there as well. So. Um, I'm not quite sure what happened in that time. There was a lot of changes. Obviously, that was the GNOME 3 release, that's, um, and also SystemD. So that was a very disruptive release, so I don't blame people for being um, cautious there. And I think that you know, of, over those releases, we've kind of, a GNOME 3 has gotten a lot of the rough edges off, and it's a lot much easier to use. Extensions work very nicely, and a lot of the you know, things that were really um, felt like you had a stick poke up in your eye. Uh, were responded to by the GNOME designers and is a lot lot nicer. If you haven't tried GNOME for a while, I actually suggest trying it. It's gotten 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 nice, I have to say. Um, and even Linus Torvalds said he could could stand it now. 
Yeah, and the same thing really with system D, which, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know, Every, was everybody here for the last talk? Uh, I just thought there's yeah, a, lot of, a lot of cool stuff going on in system D, and a lot of the things that, be, you know, because we put into Fedora, it was very rough when it went to Fedora initially, and a lot of those things, a lot of usability things, have become better and better and better over the time, and we've gotten used to it, so it's less scary, I don't know. Yeah, so another big important thing that happened here is we have a new top-level uh, Fedora governance structure um, where we have the Fedora Council, which replaces the previous Fedora board. And I think the, the most important thing here is we kind of have a charter to be more active leadership rather than just a um, sort of a governance body that waited for things to happen and then um, issued rulings on them as needed, kind of as a, um, a conscience for the project. And this is going to be a little more um, trying to set direction and somewhere where you want, when, when you want something that's going to be, you know, across the whole distribution, across the whole project, somewhere where you can come and talk to people and then have things that are more of a clarity of message overall across the project. Um, and this is a mix of uh, elected positions and meritocratic positions selected by existing Fedora committees by whatever process that committee feels like is the best way to, you know, we want somebody represents you know, the ambassadors, represents engineering. On, on this committee, we'll put you, uh, put you into place there on the committee. And then um, it also has uh, people like me who are hired by Red Hat to work on it. And uh, I think that Red Hat, you know, a little biased here, I think Red Hat has done a pretty good job of selecting people who are community engaged rather than just hiring random people from outside. And I think it would be rightfully an outcry if we did otherwise. Um, and then another important thing here is that uh, we have focus on basically medium term objectives for the project. So we have actually some, um, the, one of the main jobs that we're actually working on right now is selecting objectives that say within 18 months we want to have, you know, something like, you know, throw a workstation server cloud split. That's a thing we want to do. Um, how are we going to get there? And then we'll find somebody who will be the champion for that particular cause and then it gives uh, status reports and basically it'll be a job that'll be done in, you know, a certain amount of time. And um, those are kind of open for what those can be. Um, it can be something that's engineering related. It can be something else, you know, project communications related, anything like that. Um, and so that's getting underway as well. Um, I can answer more questions about that too. Um, okay, I'm going to go through this real fast. This is stuff that we hope to do. Um, so OpenSUSE is already doing it. It's awesome. Um, where we have a more modularized distribution where we, instead of having... Um, 20,000 packages with basically the same policy applied to all of them. We can say packages that are at the edge, they, um, the maintenance is less important. Packages that are more essential to getting your system running um, maybe need higher level of scrutiny and higher level of maintenance. Um, talk, talk, talk. Um, and so the environment and stacks group is going to be uh, working a lot on the modularization um, there. And sometime in the future, maybe we'll be able to have some sort of Linux apps thing running on Fedora, but that's way in the future. Um, again, bring Germans. Okay, uh, Fedora 22 coming up. Um, we are going back to a six month release cycle uh, and actually trying to be very strict with that to the point where this is kind of actually a five month release cycle this time around, which is causing a little bit of pain. We're um, norm normally not so strict on this, but we really want to, especially if it happened, had a long cycle before. <laughs> Um, so it looks like this is going to be a fairly minor release with just kind of enhancements and refinements on Fedora 21. Um, things like Python 3 by default. Um, I had written this in the slide before, but from what I wrote that in the slide to now, it looks like that is actually not going to be the case because we're not quite ready for that. Um, and that is also maybe the case with DNF, um, the new next generation package manager to replace yum. It may not be ready to be the default. Um, we, we will see what the case is with that. Um, new GNOME, some other things like that. Um, and, but uh, really not a lot of huge changes in this release. Okay, questions? What, I mean, we pointed, what, what's the pointing there? <laughs> yeah. Uh, in 22, certainly not. Um, so the question is with whether Wayland is going to be the default in 22. I think that it is not ready yet, but um, I've heard that it might might be proposed as a possible default for 23. Um, some of the things aren't quite ready yet. Could, could you repeat that? Do you not want to be the default in 22, although Wayland has changed? So already the, uh, the 23 added the... Okay, so 
the, uh, Christoph says that the, the login screen might be Wayland in 22, but it won't necessarily be everything else after that. Yes? Far in the future Linux apps. Okay, so um, there are several proposals um, for basically running containerized applications uh, for the desktop on Linux, and not necessarily just for the desktop. So you know, um, Docker is very successful right now at containerized applications, you know, in server and cloud space. And uh, Red Hat's working really hard on that with a Project Atomic, and we're trying to do you know, get that integrated into Fedora as well for um, server kind of um, applications, but. There's also some efforts to make it so that we can have these containerized you know, apps that would run um, in a desktop environment. And actually, Wayland is connected to that because that's part of the proposal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, that's actually a proposed feature for the, for the release is to have Elasticsearch package stuff. So we get Robin cheering back there. Uh, I believe that the feature this time is just to get it packaged up so it's easily available and um, easy to deploy. I think that we'll probably we'll go from there. What was it? Yeah. Uh, so from, uh, Yeah. Uh, so, uh, what uh, actually the state of this uh, package is itself? Yeah, okay, so the question is if you're upgrading from previous Fedora to Fedora 21 and you choose uh, you know, which, which Fedora release you want to go to, uh, what, what, actually, what is the actual effect? Uh, and Steve Gallagher could actually answer this a lot better because he worked on the technical implementation of this. But um, right now, it affects a few config files and basically which packages are installed on your system. Uh, and so there's a mechanism so that, for example, the firewall configuration um, pulled in is different depending on which one you pick. Uh, so the desktop one actually has a very loose firewall rule, whereas the server has a much more tightened down firewall. Um, so it's things like that. Yeah, so if you have an already configured system, you probably want to choose the, I think it's called non-product, basically the generic one, and then it will just continue on as you uh, are before with basically no impact on you. Um, and that was, like I said, we're, we're trying not to take away your Lego bricks, so it should be, if you've got something already there, just going on the non-product path should keep you um, basically with what you have in a, in a nice way. What's that? Yeah, right. Uh, so that's fed up, the upgrading script, if you go from one version to the next. And if you don't use fed up, if you just do a <coughs> regular update, I think you get that by default. The right, if you want to reinstall, um, then you have to choose. If you start from scratch, then you choose somewhere to start from, and then you can bring it back to the generic if you want. What about package um, yeah, I don't know what happens if you do, like there's a Fedora upgrade helper, or just do a yum upgrade from release to release. Um, I think that if you, you probably want to install the Fedora release non-product package first, and then you'll be guaranteed to get the, the thing you want. Any other questions? No? Comments? Robin. Awesome. Thank you for fetching the Fedora stickers. There's also a couple of workstations you can use. Oh, yeah. And two pins. Don't click on one. <laughs> okay. Stickers are here. You can, I guess, come up and get them. I don't know. I can throw them into the audience and it's going to work through. Uh, we got the lovely Fedora workstation stickers and some DVDs for people who still have some sort of DVD reader on their laptop, or else they, 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 they go nicely in your bookshelf, if not. That's a, 